that's pretty good. Apologies, I've just realized as I've been standing there, I have messed up the title slightly. So this talk, when I submitted it, I had a slightly different title. I think it was In Search of the Perfect Cloud Native Developer Experience. I've since found it, <laughs> maybe not. But as I have changed, I have the talk has evolved quite a bit. So this is primarily like, it's the same talk as I pitched in the CFP. It's kind of a platform rant, yeah? And we, I'm sure many of us in the room, developers, ops, QA, we're obviously deploying the apps on some form of platform. So this is gonna explore that in terms of Kubernetes, things like Envoy, bit high level, few deep dives into things. Hopefully it's useful as a, as a kind of starting point. If you are on your journey to the cloud, journey to Kubernetes, um, journey to ECS, something like that, this will share some of the mistakes I perhaps made so you can learn from my mistakes and some of the successes that teams I've worked on we've made as well. Fundamentally, we're in this game to have a bunch of ideas and deliver value to people. That can be monetary value if you work in a commercial organization. If you're for a not-for-profit, it can be just societal good. But we have, as a company, as an organization, as a team, we have hypotheses, we have ideas, we want to deliver value to users. Now, most of us in this room probably write some form of code. I started my kind of career back there. I'm sure, hopefully, a few of you remember those days as well. At the moment, though, we are deploying and exposing our apps via web applications. And we are all loving Kubernetes and platforms like that cloud platforms. Idea, coding, running it in the cloud, running it on Kubernetes, delivering value to our end users. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle here, which often gets forgotten about. Yeah? I started my career as a software engineer, love that stuff, but I've gone a lot more into ops over the years. We all recognize kind of the good thing. You know, I, I build my code, I code, I build, I test, I ship it, it all looks good, it all runs. We all recognize that good feeling when that happens. Now we're building microservices, as, as Sam said this morning. We're distributing our components, distributing our teams. We're trying new tools. I'm sure many of us can recognize that feeling when you try a new tool and it doesn't quite go as expected. Also, even worse, is when you push to prod and it falls over. Yeah, I've been there. Like day one, Kubernetes, it all looks good, poof, suddenly fell over. We all recognize the good and bad parts of these things, and this is kind of what I'm labeling, and not just me to be fair, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, but what we, as an industry, are starting to label developer experience. Yeah? And this, for me, is super important, and it also relates to the platform. I see many organizations buying into Kubernetes, and it is awesome, but it's not a PaaS. It's not a full functional platform as a service. You have to build stuff on top, and this is my journey, kind of learning that lesson. This is me at Daniel Bryant UK on the Twitters, on GitHub, on LinkedIn. I love to connect, so please do reach out to me. I've done a bunch of things over the years, academic to developer, done a couple of CTO gigs, and now I'm working with a company called Deadawire based out of Boston in the US, and we're focusing on Kubernetes tooling. So we've got the Ambassador Open Source API Gateway, which you may bump into, uh, which is basically a control plane on top of the very popular Envoy proxy. And we also have Telepresence, which is a CNCF tool as well. They're all open source tools. Um, and Telepresence allows you to do remote debugging, which I'll mention a bit about that. So I've had a sort of interesting, hopefully interesting journey and a couple of books along the way as well. So DevX 101. Um, for me, DevX is kind of... Adrian Treneman, I saw a great talk, I think it was QCon New, uh, New York two years ago, and he basically said this, developer experience is about reducing engineering friction between creating a hypothesis, an idea, to delivering observable experiments or business value in production. And I think as a software engineer, I've sometimes got a bit lost in that. I've got attracted to the shiny, Docker, Kubernetes, Go, but you've got to remember, we're all, all of us, whether developers, ops, QA, whatever, we're all in it to deliver value. And we should be looking to minimize that waste, minimize that friction for getting value into, into you know, the hands of our users. A hat tip to Adrian. Apologies. Yeah, there's a link there if you want to go into Adrian did a fantastic like, talk. I've tried to summarize it online. And this is kind of where my main definition for developer experience comes from. It's not new. Yeah, like we like as an industry to kind of, you know, put buzzwords on things. You know, hey, DevOps itself is pretty much a buzzword, yeah. But I've seen it a lot over the years. And people like Nicole Forsgren, Martin Fowler. They, I mean, this book, if you haven't read it, it's fantastic. Seriously, like it's, a, it's in the same league as kind of, you know, DevOps handbook and these kind of things. But they talk about the four most important metrics. And at least three of them are related to developer experience. How as an engineer can I find issues? How can I work with issues? How can I deploy? What's my lead time from idea to value? These kind of things. And of course, Martin, always a hat tip to Martin, very wise as he is. When he talks about microservices, the prerequisites, like 
couple of those at least are DevEx, basic monitoring, rapid app deployment. Now, for me, there's three kind of fundamental components of developer experience. And it comes, in my mind, from things like the DevOps handbook, lean software development, Mary Poppin Dieck, fantastic work there, and intentionally driving the UX of our platforms. We're very good at the UX on our front end, typically, or we aspire to be very good, but we don't apply the same things we learned to our internal tooling, I find. And we as engineers use those things like multiple times a day. So if the UI is crafty, it's kind of like, uh. If anyone's used Amazon, for example, AWS, that UI is crafty, yeah? Like trying to go on CloudWatch and look through things. You really, I think we as an industry need to get better about thinking about the, the experience we have when using these tools. And for, like, I take from DevOps the kind of systems thinking, you know, feedback loops, and building a culture or curating a culture of continual experimentation and learning. That's what I take from DevOps. Straight from Adrian's talk here from Lean, it's about minimizing waste. If I'm you know, building Docker containers, waiting 10 minutes, pushing, you know, like, that's a massively long dev loop. That's waste. Yeah, that costs the company money. And again, curating that experience, thinking about what we want to get from our tools and how we interact with these tools. A big thing I've learned over the last year from people like John Allspore is we think of code and we think of systems one way, but actually we never really see the code running. We don't see the ones and zeros. So we all have these mental models of the system. And all of our models are subtly different. That's why it's really hard working in a team. My model's different to yours. I've got to communicate what I think is going on. We never see the code running, per se. So we've got to build a model of, you know, based on the actual code itself of what's happening. These are my kind of jumping off points if you want to learn more about this stuff. But let's dial it back. Developer experience is really, you know, it's a new word around workflows and platforms. Now, in terms of workflows, I'm sure a few of you in this room have, you know, I started my career in the government, actually, UK government. It was all waterfall. Massive design doc that slapped on my desk. Day one, we actually realized that some of the designs and uh, the people had created, the BAs had created, um, they simply weren't possible with web technology at the time, which we all had a good chuckle about, because that doc then went back and it got changed and came back again. We moved from waterfall to mini waterfall. Oh, excuse me, agile, I meant to say there, yeah? Uh, agile is fundamentally about doing the same thing, but doing it in faster loops, yeah? And now we're kind of moving to something else. Netflix are calling it the full life cycle dev team. They've got a very interesting article around this. We've talked around it a dead a while. We are kind of pitch on this, trying to commoditize some of the stuff. Netflix are Netflix. We're not all Netflix, of course. But people like James Governor, very smart, uh, based in London, founded and, and runs Redmonk, talks about another kind of buzzword called progressive delivery. Yeah, continuous delivery. You know, hopefully many of you like all dialed into that. It's the continual you know, delivery of value into production. Progressive delivery, it is a buzzword, and someone's rightly kind of spun back and said, it's just continuous delivery. But the point James is making is that a lot of things like feature flags, canarying, shadowing, this kind of stuff adds a lot of value now. We don't just push stuff out into prod and see what happens. We only let 2% of our user traffic see the new feature. We turn a flag on. If it goes wrong, we turn a flag off. And they're trying to put into this progressive delivery in that this is a thing to think about. And you need to code your applications and build the platform to support this incremental rollback, a rollout, sorry, and rollback. And the platforms like, need to be observable. The applications need to be observable. You need to understand from a business and operational point of view what is going on. So it is a bit buzzwordy, but these are good jump off points. And I, I really like what James is doing in this space. I think it's well worth watching. I move on, so one second. Um, so, you know, Sam talked about this this morning. We, as an industry, are liking this modularization. Yeah, microservices are fundamentally about modularization. There's a lot of value in running kind of autonomous teams, like squads in Spotify's parlance, these kind of things. I've worked on a bunch of microservice projects, and one anti-pattern I've definitely seen, and Stefan Tilkov put this together really nicely, I think it was last year at Micro Exchange in Berlin, it's very tempting when you're working as autonomous teams to autonomously build parts of the platform. Now, I've definitely seen this. I worked on a project we had Ruby, Java, and Go in the mix. And we had service discovery was different across all three um, languages. We were using circuit breakers, Hystrix in Java. Uh, and we, we found a really janky Hystrix for Ruby online. And it was like not maintained, and the semantics were different. So I've definitely I've been there. I've done it. I've accidentally built multiple different bits of the platform and yeah, they were, sometimes they were actual code libraries. Sometimes we tried to pull stuff out. But when you try and build, like, say, code libraries, you end up building a microcosm of lots of mini platforms in your system. And this, I think, is, is generally bad. 
As a large organization, you may inevitably have from merger and acquisition, Kubernetes here, uh, AWS here, Google here, whatever, that's not a problem. But you should strive not to build mini platforms, particularly in, like, in sort of close located teams. What I think we really want is some form of kind of centralized platform. And I'm seeing this working quite well in organizations. And you have like not only a centralized platform, there's kind of self-service APIs to, to drive it. There's subject matter experts you can reach out to and, and bring into your team, these kind of things. Um, we've seen this a lot at DataWire. And one other interesting challenge we're seeing is that often in a large organization, teams are working at different stages in their idea generation. Some of them are prototyping. Some of them are pushing stuff to prod. And some of them, it's like mission critical. Like if that goes down, the business is like in big trouble. And that, that really makes it challenging to build a platform that supports all three different requirements. Yeah? So we, we've kind of worked to put quite a bit on this. Now, one thing, you know, if you do a talk about Kubernetes, you have to quote Kelsey Hightower. It's in, it's in the bylaws. You have to quote Kelsey Hightower. He's, like, he's amazing, and he's got so much wisdom. But I really like this quote in particular. It says, I'm convinced the majority of people managing infrastructure just want a platform as a service, something like Heroku or Cloud Foundry. The only requirement is it has to be built by them. I've seen that. I've done that. Right? So Kelsey, when he said that, I was like, hell yeah, Kelsey, you're on something there. And the point is, is nothing wrong with building a PaaS. If, you're, if you are a Cloud Foundry, you are Amazon, that's totally cool. But for your business, do you derive value from building a platform? Unless you are Pivotal, unless you are Amazon, probably not, yeah. So some companies are big enough to justify this. Netflix, uh, yeah, this is Netflix, and I learned a bunch from Nico from Shopify last year. Like these companies, like Netflix is Netflix, yeah, you know, we're certainly not all Netflix, but they, even there, with their sort of freedom and responsibility culture, they have realized that having a paved road, having a standardized platform, makes it much easier to support in production. The freedom and responsibility, usually in Netflix, you do what you like, but you support it yourself, yourself your team. But they realized it's actually really challenging to support that at scale. So they've built a platform around Mesos. And I think they're looking at Kubernetes now. Nico from Shopify, kind of online um, uh, e-commerce kind of uh, hosting site, they were using Heroku, but it wasn't scaling to their needs. So they built a platform around Kubernetes, but they wrapped very intentionally a Heroku-like experience on top of Kubernetes. They built tools where their engineers could do Git push, and all the magic of kubectl was hidden behind the scenes. And it, you know, I'm not saying everyone should do that, but they were, I really learned a lot about Nico about asking the right questions from my engineering team. I've worked on a couple of projects where ops teams have built a platform without ever talking to the dev teams. And then they wonder why the dev teams don't like it. And it's kind of it's up here, we're all thinking that's really obvious, but trust me, I've seen it in big organizations where ops go, I'll just build a mini Amazon. I'll just build, you know, whatever. Nico, from day one, he got security, all the dev teams, um, he got, I think, CTO involved, and he basically said, like, you know, what do we all like from our existing platform? What are the challenges? What do I build on top? They evaluated, they ultimately went with Kubernetes and some other things. So these are good references, hopefully, for you to learn some more. The question I'm really kind of trying to get at today from yourselves is, should you? build a pass on top of Kubernetes. I'm sure many of you in this room are moving to Kubernetes, or ECS, or you know, something like that, yeah. Some fundamental questions, yeah. Do you understand your problem domain? Is your problem domain complex? Do you have product market fit? If you answer no to those, I think keep it simple. Whoops. If you really want to use containers, by all means, but just build a monolith in a container, put it on App Engine or something, yeah? Keep it really simple. If you, if you haven't, you know, if you don't know your domain, you don't know how you're going to deliver value, why build a platform yet? We might not be around in a year's time as a business. Is your solution heavily event-driven and simple? Yeah? Should you be adding value elsewhere? Are you trying to find that product market fit? And there, I think, this is my best joke in my deck, you should go serverless. Yeah? I think you should aim for things like, say, Lambda or Google Cloud Functions or Azure. Yeah? Or maybe you look at things like Kafka, like some very cool stuff. But I'm really liking these things for kind of spiking and prototyping really quick. And often, the, if you're keeping it quite simple, the cloud kind of um, systems have got like workflows baked in. 
So there's no need for a pipeline. You know, there's no need for a button. You can literally edit JavaScript in like the Lambda console if you want, kind of thing. So, you know, and what I'm trying to say here is, is think about where you're at as an organisation. And I went to Continuous Lifecycle London yesterday, another conference just up the road. Uh, chat to Matthew Skelton. He's the keynote here this afternoon. Listen to Matthew. He's a very wise man, and I had a fantastic chat with him. But he did his talk, and one of the things he said, he said like you should always aim to build the thinnest viable platform. Much like the minimum viable product, he said, aim to build the thinnest viable platform. If you can get away with stitching together a couple of Amazon services or Heroku or whatever, then stick with that and wait until your business, you know, always be looking ahead, but wait until you can actually justify building a rich platform on top of something else. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm kind of thinking you probably are going towards something like Kubernetes, yeah? And what are, the reason I like Kubernetes, for example, is it is built kind of sort of on the solid principles. Allegedly, Kubernetes was actually written in Java first off, and I found quite interesting. Now it's Go, but like the solid principles are kind of evident, and they've really thought about the API and making it open for extension. You can, like, I worked on Mesos for a while, and Mesos was really hard to extend. It was C++, wasn't designed as well as Kubernetes. Whereas Kubernetes has kind of won that, that battle, yeah? Lots of hosted options. I say run it, run it like on GKE or something, or run it on Amazon. Don't run it yourself if you can, uh, if you can get away with that. But know where your extension points are. And for me, like, the key things I learned a lot from Nico, and we've done it quite a bit in DataWire now, is things like custom resources and controllers. You often see them packaged as something called operators in, in Red Hat speak. Uh, or Nico created Cloud Buddies. And like, these are ways to do things that are bespoke to your organization, but fitting in to the framework of Kubernetes. I've seen some folks try and mangle the command line of Kubernetes or mangle services in to do stuff like run Redis properly. But operators have got a whole life cycle, a whole SDK, where you can basically, it, it, it tries to simulate the manual operator the person working with Redis or working with whatever, like you can do a kind of control loop in Kubernetes. So if your you know, Redis server crashes, you can migrate data off stateful sets, and then you can like, spin up something else. It's a way to add extra automation in and extra functionality, but in a way that fits in with the Kubernetes design philosophy. So always look at your platform, understand where the extension points are. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Admiralty, uh, there's a great article about um, sort of evaluating how to use some of these things. So I'll put a link for you there. I'll share the deck later on. Um, I can't remember the gent's name now, but I chatted to him quite a bit on Twitter. I learned a bunch from, from him, and that article was really useful. And um, there's the link, actually, for, like, um, for Red Hat's operators model. And there's Nico, again, talking about how they had created... They call them cloud buddies. They're, they're, they're kind of extension of CRDs and sort of operators. But um, they really thought about how they were going to add functionality that their developers wanted in a Kubernetes-friendly way. So that was really good. good. Another good example, if you're looking to understand operators, Flux from Weaveworks is really nice. And this also gives me an opportunity to plug, if you haven't heard of a concept called GitOps, it's again another buzzword, but it's really quite nice. GitOps basically treats your Git repo, your config for Kubernetes and your apps, as your single source of truth. And, and basically, this, is, this runs as an as a, um, operator in Kubernetes, looks at your config repos, and continually runs a control loop. So if stuff breaks and you know, other uh, instances get spun up, um, Flux will make sure that you know, what you've claimed in Kubernetes should be running is. If you want to bump versions of apps, you can just update your um, config, and uh, Flux will be looking at that config, and it will run the control loop, and you'll get your apps deployed. It's a really nice example of how to extend Kubernetes, but it's also a really nice tool in terms of continuous delivery in a Kubernetes-friendly way. Because a lot of modern infrastructure is going more towards declarative, as in you declare what you want to happen, rather than imperative instructions. And GitOps and this kind of stuff is very nice. How quick do you need feedback? Is the key thing. So you imagine like this kind of dev loop. You've got always the outer loop going on where you're kind of like doing PRs and getting code reviews in your team, but you've clearly got this, um, this inner dev loop going on as well. Yeah? And I must um, quote, uh, it's Mitch Denny I got this from. So like, oh, we were thinking about this quite a bit, like uh, at, at other companies I worked at, Open Credo and, um, and also DataWire. But Mitch did a fantastic article which really kind of locked this down. And what I, as I got into Docker in particular, I found my Java dev loop was, was a lot more painful. So I was coding my Java in my IDE, IntelliJ, or whatever. But when I wanted to ship something up to the integration testing, I had to build a Docker container, 
had to push it to a registry, had to deploy it. And th this kind of inner loop was somewhat slowed down in some circumstances. And like the Microsoft team, the Azure team, have put together a really nice diagram, which kind of illustrates the pain point if you're working with Docker images, yeah? As in, you have to code your app, write the Docker files, create the images, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into that kind of thing. There is a whole bunch of tools I wanted to um, sort of put your way if you are looking to automate that dev loop process. It's not quite as good as when I was working on the monolith and you had like live reload going on in your browser, but we are getting that way with, with kind of um, container tech. Uh, Shahid did a fantastic article comparing a bunch of tools um, and Matt Farina has really gone into explaining sort of what the new world of Kubernetes and things look like and how it maps to the old world. So I, was, I used to use like a lot of Red Hat packages and, and Debs and stuff. And, and now there's Helm and Kubernetes and a bunch of other uh, tools. And Matt basically breaks down here how the old world, you know, Ansible, uh, Debs, how that maps to tools that are available in Kubernetes. I learned a bunch from Matt uh, there as well. So I kind of just, you know, dumping a few things. If, you, if you're looking to automate that inner dev loop, you're coding, you're building containers, you're pushing stuff up, there is a bunch of tools. On the left here, this is kind of the automation frameworks for doing that build in the background. So you're running a few containers locally, um, you're, you know, coding some stuff, and it's building it, it's putting it into the container. It's even, with scaffold, you can even put it in your pipeline and so forth. Things on the right, they're more like packaging. So Helm, I mentioned, and Ksonet are sort of more packaging things. Um, if you're just from the Java world, kind of like, you know, jars and stuff and, and manifests within your jars, think of them like that. And telepresence, I mentioned already, that enables you to proxy into a remote cluster. So basically, the way I think of telepresence is that I put my laptop effectively in the cluster. So I can look around in the namespaces, network namespaces, I can debug a Java app using IntelliJ, but it's talking to all the remote services in the cloud and, and in my um, Kubernetes namespace. Kind of funky. These are quite... These are valuable tools to look at. They're all fast evolving, but you know, check them out. As I sort of mentioned about um, telepresence there, developing and testing services locally, I, I did a whole talk about this yesterday actually at Continuous Lifecycle with my friend uh, Abraham Marin Perez, um, and we talked about sort of thinking about how you um, develop microservices, and we always say try and do as much local development as possible mock things, um, use appropriate interfaces, use tools like service virtualization. You want to run as much as you can on your, on your, like locally without being dependent on other services. Because the more stuff you have to spin up on your laptop, the more coupled you are to those release cycles of those services. And like my laptop, even with 16 gigs, I can only get so many Java apps running <laughs> at any one time. Yeah. So working locally has many advantages. One of the, the, you know, cost, the cost is a big one. You're not running like 100 GKE instances or Fargate instances in the cloud or something. But it's, it can be quite tricky, particularly at some stages of the testing. Like if you're trying to do some kind of integration test, but you, you want to like have a fair bit of stuff spun up in, in the cloud, but you want to kind of monitor your individual component, your individual service you're working on. Maybe you're doing some production style debugging. There's lots of work going on in this space within industry at the moment. Um, I'm working on, let's say, telepresence, which I mentioned already. Uh, the solo team have got something called Squash. So um, telepresence at the moment effectively swaps out a Kubernetes deployment with a proxy. So it literally, I do telepresence on my machine, swaps out the actual running code in the cloud with a proxy, and all the traffic gets proxied to my machine and back into the cluster so I can live debug on my machine. Squash does the same thing, but it actually hijacks the proxies. The, the, they run Envoy in the cloud. And as, if you imagine sort of the gaps between your services, a lot of people are using things like service meshes these days and, and proxies, and it hijacks those proxies. So you can basically tap in to all the traffic going in through the cluster. We're working on something similar, actually, with telepresence now as well. But do think about, you know, when you're spinning up these kind of microservice teams, as they grow and you get more services, how are you going to test it all? Test as much locally as you can, but when you inevitably have to go to the cloud, check out some of these tools for like putting your laptop effectively in the cluster. And just as a slight aside, something to, I'd like to leave you to think about, I guess, something I'm pondering, maybe as a conversation piece. Um, I'm seeing a, a kind of two approaches by organizations, by vendors in general. One is the kind of bring the cloud to you thing. So, um, this was, I think it was like some Solo and a Rookout and a couple of other companies I chatted to at KubeCon in, in Seattle last year. They were very much about, yeah, bringing the cloud to me. So I'm running my services in the cloud, but I can sort of bring them locally and debug and then put them back. Telepresence, kind of same kind of vibe. But then there's also this push towards putting you in the cloud. 
Amazon, for example, have, uh, they uh, acquired Cloud9 a while back. Like it's an online IDE. So you can spin up an EC2 instance in Amazon. You could literally code, like dumb terminal, code in the cloud. You can use SAM local, it's called, to do dev loops on, on an EC2 instance in the cloud. And you never need, a, like you can do it on a Chromebook or an iPad or something. You never need an, a nice Mac. Um, Red Hat are doing, they've invested quite a bit in Eclipse G and other kind of Kubernetes friendly IDEs. So just something to think about. In five years time, will we be going back to the kind of dumb terminals where we're all coding in the cloud and we don't need to even worry about local development experience because we're in the cloud. I'm not sure where this is going, but I'm finding it interesting. I'm doing more work over here, but I think equally on the right is super valuable. Next question, how do you want to verify your system? Yeah, and, and fantastic work by Cindy Shridharan, a copy construct on Twitter. I'm sure a few of you bumped into the um, test pyramid, you know, where you get unit tests on the bottom and manual tests at the top, and it says you basically do more unit tests than you do manual tests because you know, manual tests are more expensive. Now, like any model, you know, it's, it's sort of wrong, but it's useful. And Cindy's basically arguing that when we're building these complex distributed adaptive systems, that there's only so much guarantee we can get pre-prod. There's all different microservices, there's cloud, commodity hardware, there's Kubernetes involved, there's all these things. So clearly you want to value pre-production testing. Cindy is totally saying that. You can see that here, all the kind of stack classic stuff we're used to. But she's also saying there's a whole lot of value on post-production testing. Things like chaos engineering, things like um, canarying to see what's, you know, uh, success of things. Um, and I am more and more dialing into this. As I've worked on bigger, more complicated systems, you know, you definitely want to do pre-prod testing, but compared to the monoliths I used to work on, we're nowhere near getting as good a success rate of, you know, eliminating bugs as we used to. So you want to have really good observability on, uh, in production to know when stuff is going wrong before your customers. Uh, but you also want to be nudging stuff in prod. Like, if you haven't bumped into synthetic transactions, I've used them a bunch. I think Sam knew and actually might have even taught me about those. But basically, like, look for your critical business value flows. So if you're e-commerce, it's things like uh, searching for products, adding products to your basket, and checking out, maybe. You want to do like, fake traffic uh, to test those things in production. Create a fake user, fake products, and then have like, a fake checkout thing. But exercise as much of the real system as you can and run that on a loop. And if for any reason any of those synthetic fake transactions fail, you know you've got a problem. You're losing money. So you need to go and fix. You know, it's kind of like running tests in production continually. So um, Martin Fowler's got a good blog on that if you want to look at that. Cindy's talked about this quite a bit as well. Um, what I'm going to focus on now is canary testing. So canary testing is really powerful. Just launching something and only giving, say, like 2% of your users an actual view in, into this kind of stuff. Um, it does require a bunch of things sort of up front. And, and of course, Etsy made it super popular. Who have I got there? Oh, Netflix are doing stuff. Uh, if you bumped into like Spinnaker and Kayenta, Netflix are doing this stuff quite a lot. People are trying to automate the canaries, which is super interesting as well. So I, I mentioned earlier on, I'm working on Envoy quite a bit, or working with Envoy, I should say. And Envoy, like basically, it's, you know, I'm sure you bumped into the term service mesh, service mesh, all the things at the moment, yeah? It's kind of like the new Kubernetes or whatever. But there's a lot of value into running service meshes. Yeah, there's a lot of value into taking some of the cross-cutting concerns out of the apps and putting them into the communication fabric. Kubernetes is really good at giving you deployment primitives. Kubernetes gives you services, it gives you pods, and you can deploy things very nicely, but it's not very good at runtime communication. And when you've got this dynamic, adaptive, microservice-based system, you want a quite fine-grained control over what service can talk to what service. Envoy seems to be the answer. If you haven't bumped into Envoy Proxy, I'm sure you'll hear a bunch more of it the uh, next coming years. Literally, all the clouds are using it. Yeah, so Lyft created it. Matt Klein created it in, in Lyft. Uh, they're kind of like a US version of Uber. And um, now App Mesh and Amazon, uh, G GKE has got um, all over Envoy. They're committing to it. Um, and uh, Azure are using it as well. So we're, we're actually working with the Azure team in DataWire. So like, Envoy is everywhere. It's really powerful. Um, it does allow that kind of fine-grained release control. You can literally say 1% of traffic here, 1% of traffic here as well. Nginx, you can do similar kind of things. I've used Nginx a bunch in the past. But I, I just find Envoy is a bit more cloud-native than Nginx. Yeah. There is many control planes, so I work on Ambassador. Hands up on that one. Glue team from Solo. I'm sure a few of you have heard the Istio, the Google marketing machine has done fantastic work on the Istio brand. And I'm also working on Console Connect now. So I'm doing a webinar literally this afternoon about using Ambassador uh, with the HashCorp team uh, um, using Console Connect. 
These are, are definitely things to look into if you're looking for technologies. Uh, GKE, the hosted version of Google, uh, hosted version of Kubernetes on Google, bakes in Istio, for example. You can run a managed Istio in the cloud. So this, this is actually a data uh, ambassador open source example where I used to like do canarying. I used to set up, say, like I've got a service at the top and two deployments. I used to kind of I had like one replica of this version, nine replicas of this version, and it's kind of like 10% canarying. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's that. It works. It works okay. But then like, with ambassador. You can literally just like deploy multiple services, so V1 and V2 of my services, and the kind of we use annotations just to do some config, and I've got like wait one, and that's simple as like just one percent of traffic is going to go to this new like canary service, and I can you know I can put other things down and mess around. Again, you can do all this stuff with nginx, you can do it with um, HA proxy and things like that, but the UX is a little more challenging around some of those older proxies. I like Envoy, I like Ambassador. Flagger, if you look into Canary within uh, a service mesh, I want to mention Weaveworks again. Weaveworks doing awesome work in this space. Uh, we've used Flagger. We're looking to work with Flagger a bit more. It's basically a way of like, specifying using CRDs, like I mentioned before, the custom resource controllers. You specify, I'm deploying V2 of my app here. I want to roll out 1% um, of production traffic every 10 minutes to it unless this metric fails. And it will automate this for you. It goes right V2 of the app deployed, and it will start rolling traffic into it. Oh, suddenly the K your KPIs drop. You know, like you're losing money, or there's a production like a spike in a CPU, and Flagger will stop, and it will roll the stuff back. Automated kind of deployment. Very nice tools. Some gotchas in this kind of platform space: observability, monitoring, logging, distributed tracing. Call it what you will, but monitoring is a prerequisite. You need to have an understanding of SLIs, SLOs, and KPIs. If you, if you don't, the Google um, handbook, uh, Google SRE, sorry, handbook is fantastic. SLIs are fundamentally things like, you know, core metrics. You bundle them together in terms of service, like quality of service metrics, SLOs effectively. And you clearly want to have some idea of business metrics there as well. You're very concerned if your throughput goes down. You're very concerned if CPU spikes. But say you're losing money or you're gaining money, you want to know about these things in terms of business metrics. Yeah. It does, if you're going to canary successfully, you do need quite high volumes of traffic. I had a few folks try and create canaries on their platforms, and they only had like 10 requests to their API a day. So like 10 requests a day, 1% like of traffic means nothing. <laughs> so we had a real hard time. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a solution we did in the end. And we also had another situation where folks were wanting to canary, but they only had like 90% of their traffic was one thing, and like 10% of their traffic was another. And they were trying to canary test the, the other. So all the traffic was going through. It was not actually exercising the paths they wanted to test. But we, when, we, when we look back, we're like, Dope. but at the time, we forgot about that. <laughs> uh, do take care of side effects. If you're canarying, um, you know, you, like if you're going to need database schema changes, be very careful. Uh, I, I haven't done it myself, I don't think, but I've seen teams where they rolled out a canary version of a service. Uh, it required a DDL, a, a schema change. The, it was with Spring Boot, so Spring Boot did that automatically, and it broke all the production services. So it deployed Canary, it updated the DDL, all the production services now no longer could read that schema. And they all fell over, and the Canary was like only serving 10% of traffic. So we had a, we had a hard time that day. Um, but so you've got to watch that kind of stuff. And also, same with data stores. If you are messing around with new data formats in like Mongo or something, you, know, you, you have to sort of um, stagger your deploys to be able to read both forms of the schema in your services, things like that. So very quickly, like, so a few sort of tips. Focus, if you haven't got good enough metrics, focus on what the SRE team call the, um, uh, the golden signals, latency, traffic, errors, saturation. I, you, know, you can try and automate all this stuff, but it is OK to initially eyeball data, yeah, I, I think. Have some graphs going on. You know, when you're deploying, just look at the graphs. You'll get a feel for them, maybe how you can automate that in the future. I think folks get a bit hung up on automating too much of that, the metric stuff sometimes. Do create actionable alerts. If you're losing money, like, trust me, like, we need to know fast. What, how we got around with this high volume traffic is we actually load tested. We, we used synthetic requests. We flagged them with a header so they weren't actually counted as production traffic, but they exercised our system. So that 10 requests a day, we actually spun up like 1,000 or more in Amazon like services that were hitting our production um, workload um, and just to test the kind of stuff. And it was with a, uh, fly, uh, with a canary header, for example. You can, I mentioned synthetic transactions already. Create fake users, create fake data, but exercise your real system. Yeah, and I find that quite a useful pattern. 
Uh, and things like with side effects, I, I did a bunch of work on a tool called Hoverfly, but there's many other tools out there. It's open source, but you can virtualize other services. So if you're like if you've got a canary which you you don't want, you want to limit the impact of the side effects. You can use a fake service, effectively a fake uh, upstream service, a fake coupled service with it um, to give like pre-canned data or, or whatever to minimize the blast radius. Um, in terms of uh, observability UX, now I'm totally guilty. So I'm an engineer at heart. I want to build observability dashboards like this, yeah. But I realized most of the time I need this and this, yeah. Like I, I just I love looking at graphs and get some Kibana going on, get some Grafana going on. For a nuclear power plant, probably this is warranted. But if you think about it, like even Chernobyl and so forth, like the hard times are happening there because folks didn't understand what was fully going on on this dashboard. We as engineers really need to think about the UX of these things and make stuff as simple as possible. Again, work with the teams. Like I really like handing off release of functionality to product owners or, or people in the team that are kind of designated that. And if it's a non-technical product owner, you, you don't want to be giving them all this because they, they don't care about this. They only care about like, you know, am I making money? Is there any issues? Like, where's the launch button? Where's the feature flag that turns this on and off? Really think about the UX of the tools and who is going to be using the tools as well. Final kind of question. So another thing I get a lot is, particularly in large organizations, do you want to implement guardrails for your teams? Do you want to constrain what people can do? Yeah. Um, larger teams often want this kind of stuff. They want to homogenize the developer experience because people are moving around on projects and like they've got massive scale, these kind of things. Startups, small companies probably value team independence, so less guard, guardrails. Um, some, like, if you look at the kind of Netflix experience, Netflix have actually said, here's this paved road, here's this PaaS, but you can totally run anything you like in production, but you're on call. Yeah, so if you don't want to use our Mesos based PaaS, you can spin up some Kubernetes, you can do it up, you know, I presume there'll be a few constraints, but Netflix in general are pretty chill with this stuff. But the deal is, you are on call. If, you know, if this thing goes, like, goes down, like, you're going to be getting the page, you're expected to, to fix it which I think you know, freedom and responsibility totally makes sense. But the hybrid, you know, offering some form of centralized platform for 90% of use cases is great. Allow people to detour off of when they really need to. And then it's really a build versus buy discussion. Uh, Manuel is going to be talking here today. This is Manuel's article. He wrote up Melanie Sebula's talk at uh, QCon London. And the Airbnb team basically built a bunch of tools and a workflow around Kubernetes. They build some tools that basically um, shell out to kubectl and other things and, and add some extra logging and do some extra stuff. And I was really impressed. Again, like Melanie and her team had really thought about the UX of how they as engineers were interacting with Kubernetes. What kind of stuff were they doing every day? What kind of guardrails did they want to stop them doing accidentally daft stuff? Now, you can buy this stuff. You can go on OpenShift. Yeah, a bunch of clients I've worked with in the past. Red Hat, fantastic company, offers support. They, they offer quite a few guardrails. You can lock down the cluster. You can lock down the dev workflow. This is you know, totally a decision. I'm not saying one is, is better than the other, but recognize what you're doing. It's very tempting to kind of fall into this one. You start building all these tools around your platform, and before you know it, you're, you've got like a whole team managing the platform. And is that really what you want, whereas you could pay Red Hat some money? You know, and we as engineers are quite expensive, actually, so that's, that's definitely something to, to think about. Last one just to think about is, like, I'm a really big advocate of security stuff at the moment. I think we as an industry don't pay enough attention to security. I know, like, Equifax, obviously everyone heard of that one, but, like, Equifax got caught. I think a lot of other folks, BA, British Airways, got caught. I think a lot of other folks just haven't got caught yet, to be honest, yeah? And we as an industry are a little bit lazy on some of this stuff. I think regulation might be coming. But what I want to say is there are tools out there. You can use role-based access control in Kubernetes. This is actually a nice example of using an operator to enforce security in, in a cluster. There's Critis for enforcing, you know, you can basically cryptographically sign your Docker images. So the QA team does some QA. They cryptographically sign the image. Or maybe you do some sort of automated build process, and it cryptographically signs that image. And you only deploy cryptographically signed images. Critis is basically, it's a fancy metadata repo. Um, is it Graphius underneath? And Critis is like a, a binary authorization tool on top. This only runs, I think, in GKE at the moment. It's, it's open source as far as I know, but open runs, only runs in Google. But I'm sure more of this is coming. Um, we, uh, Datawire, we're using a whole bunch of stuff from Jetstack, London-based company. Jetstack are awesome. Uh, like Cert Manager automates TLS certification uh, using like Let's Encrypt and stuff like that. Um, so many times I've, I've seen uh, clients, uh, their TLS certificates expire, and then it causes 
lots of pain. Like when you install Jet, Jetstack's search manager, it's kind of an operator. It will con continually refresh as appropriate your TLS certificates uh, externally uh, for your, from your cluster. So this stuff I really do, do recommend looking at. Right, on the final kind of furlong now. So getting started, people often ask me, like, where do I focus as an engineer on this platform? Yeah, you know, we, we kind of know this, like going back to this thing, we want kind of some, maybe some centralized team. We're all going at different speeds. Like, you probably can identify most with one of those things. You're either prototyping, you've got early ideas, you've got some stuff in prod. There's often a mix of these things, some in mission critical. Excuse me. But like, where, if I'm starting to build a platform, where should I focus? And I think for a prototype, worry about sort of the local um, dev and test experience. You might want to be canarying. You might want to be using load testing to generate synthetic kind of, you know, canaries to see what, how your system behaves under load. Guide rails, like as the kids say, YOLO, you only live once. Yeah, like doing a bit of YOLO. You don't really worry about guide rails. You're trying to find product market fit. You're trying to explore the problem space. Um, you really want to focus on those inner dev loops, going as fast as you can, coding, trying out hypothesis, trying out ideas. Continuous integration is a no-brainer. Continuous delivery is harder. Continuous um, uh, deployment, sorry, is harder. But you want to look at those things as well. If you're more in the pro production stages, like you want to probably have a, some, maybe a hybrid, kind of like using uh, telepresence or squash. Um, you want local dev as much as you can. You're probably going to have some staging clusters as well to test a few things. Canarying, pre-prod testing, you probably want to emphasize more on the pre-prod testing with production. Start putting a few guide rails in. Maybe you're augmenting your tools. Maybe that's a time when you think, I probably should be using OpenShift, for example, something like that. And I definitely recommend on making your system observable from a tech and a business point of view and um, adding scaffolding. So a couple of projects I've worked on, we've actually created like uh, using Rundeck, I think it was, or Jenkins, where you could literally type in a name of a microservice, press a button, and out, uh, like in GitHub, a new project is formed with links in to all the monitoring. It's got example kind of scaffolding code. So we codified our best practice apps um, by, like it was a generator, like using like, Yeoman or whatever. You just like, literally crank the handle, type in a few parameters, and it will scaffold up an app for you that is linked into CI already, that is linked into observability already. And we, we got a lot of value from that. But that was more of an advanced practice. When you go mission critical, like you probably definitely want to do a bunch of stuff locally, maybe some kind of hybrid staging stuff going on. Um, like you, you're probably going to be more proxying into like staging environments than you are live product live environments because mission critical systems is often like GDPR and there's often regulations where you can't access private data, production data. So you need to use like synthetic data like, to do these kind of things. Pre-production testing, you're definitely emphasizing that whole bunch. You may be canarying, like if you're Netflix or Google, you're, you're totally canarying everything. And I've seen a lot of big companies, Capital One, you know, big companies doing like canarying on mission critical systems. They do have strong guide rails though. They do, you know, people can only push to certain areas and do certain things. And you really, this is straight from the uh, Accelerate book by Nicole Forsgren and co. You really need to focus on observability and debugability, yeah? And in particular, being able to recreate scenarios is really valuable if you've got mission critical systems. Being able to replay requests and responses, replay events in the system uh, is really good for when you're trying to debug stuff under fire. There is a bunch of cool tools popping up in that space too. There is LightStep um, doing distributed tracing and um, Honeycomb from Charity Majors and Co. are doing a lot of very interesting uh, work in that space too as well. So, in conclusion, hopefully this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of a few thinking points if you're on your journey or you're thinking about building a platform or thinking about your developer experience. What I'm trying to say is it's, it's really about minimizing the friction from we as engineers, we, you know, we as business folks, we are about having this idea and getting it through to an observable value in production or an observable experiment in production. How you construct your platform massively impacts developer experience. I think it's pro probably one of the biggest leverage points, but it's one of the points we typically forget about the most. And I'm speaking from experience. I have often accidentally built a platform. We just need stuff, and we bolt stuff on. We, we know, oh, we've got no observability. We'll chuck in, you know, elk stack. And you sort of, like, you kind of crafty, you know, and, like, when, when a new engineer joins the team, you know what you've done is bad when they're, like, really struggling to understand how all this stuff works together. And you think it's a platform, and you're like, I'm sure this makes sense, but 
really think about the UX experience of building a platform. And in particular, hopefully you, you took away some of the points I've really struggled on, and I've learned a bunch of stuff too, is things like local development loops, um, continuous delivery, how you release stuff, canarying, feature flagging, observability, debuggability, recreatability, all these kind of things are, are really important. So I think that brings us pretty much up to lunchtime, which is like, good for me, I'm liking that. Uh, at that point, I shall say thanks for your time. Appreciate your attendance. Thank <laughs> you.